as we're sailing along Not a cloud in the sky We know it won't be long There'll be teardrops in our eyes Cause we all feel pain and strife As we face the storms of life But fear not, cause there's a night in the storm And Jesus is the eye of the storm great success but he said he'd always be there when times were hard to bear when the seas of life get rough his grace is more than enough just hold on there's a night in the storm And Jesus is the eye of the storm A place of quiet rest safe from all beautiful song that is. Amen. And what a beautiful reality that is. Praise God. Jesus Christ is the eye in the storm. I'll never forget, that's the scripture the Lord saved me with. My mother put that scripture down at the bottom of the letter she sent me. I wasn't saved. And she sent me a letter. In the bottom of the letter, there was a scripture, Psalm 32, 8. I will guide thee with mine eye. I will instruct thee and show thee in the way which thou shalt go. He is the eye in the storm, folks. 
The title of the message this afternoon, if you have your Bible, Why Call Me Lord? Why call me Lord and do not the things which I say? Why call me Lord? What would be the motive of someone calling him Lord? Why would they want to call him Lord if they're not going to do what he says? You ever thought about that? What's the motive behind calling Jesus Lord and not treating him as he's Lord? If he's Lord, he says, if I'm Lord, and I am, he says, if I'm Lord, do what I say to do. And uh, so what would be the reason, what would be the purpose of calling him Lord and not doing what he says? I mean, that goes deep. you got to understand, that, that digs down deep because that deals with the motive. That deals with the motive of your heart. Now, you think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. Let that work in your spirit. Let that work in your heart. Why would you call Jesus Lord? And then not do what he says to do. I, I don't. Need, I mean, I can't grasp that. I, I, I don't know why somebody would want to call Jesus Lord and then not do what he says to do. I think partly it's because people think just by calling him Lord that, that they're saved. If they just say he's their Savior, then they're saved. They can do whatever they want to do. But what does the Scripture say? Many will say unto the, me on that day, Lord, Lord. Amen? And he will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So, obviously it's not enough. It's not enough to call him Lord. It's not enough to say that he's Lord. He must be Lord. And I've often said that if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Now I know there's this teaching today called Lordship Salvation. We make Jesus the Lord of our life. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. We don't make him anything. He makes us. He said, follow me and I'll make you. You don't make Jesus do anything. You submit to him. and he be, He's your Lord when you submit to him. Even Paul the Apostle, before Paul... Uh, before Paul the Apostle uh, even knew Jesus, he called him Lord. On the road to Damascus, Paul's having this off-struck experience, a light that's brighter than the noonday sun. He struck to the ground, and Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? Paul knew he was the Lord. Paul knew he was supreme. But he didn't know him. But even he called him Lord. But was Paul submitted to him at that point? No. He wasn't doing God's will at that point. And we see in the Old Testament where Eli told Samuel, after the third time coming to Eli, finally he said, Listen, I think the Lord's trying to talk to you, trying to talk, trying to call you. He says, Next time you hear this voice, he says, the Lord's voice, he says, Say to him, Lord, thy servant heareth 
thee. And so Samuel went back, lay down, and the voice came again, and he didn't say, Lord. He just said, Thy servant heareth thee. Why didn't Samuel say what Eli said to say? Because I, I want you to know, people, that there is people today calling Jesus Lord, and he's not Lord at all. At least Samuel was honest. Eli was not right with God. Just calling Jesus Lord's not enough. Many shall call him Lord and be damned. He says, I will profess unto them I never knew them. Can you imagine? People that think they're saved. People think they're doing God's service. They think that they're following the real Jesus. And they find out in the end, he says, I never knew you. You cannot continue in iniquity, continue in sin, and, uh, and, and, be, and be saved. You've you got to give up sin. You've got to stop sinning. There's got to be repentance. Uh, the scripture says, let him that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That doesn't mean that you get it all at once, that you become perfect all at once, and you're not going to sin against the Lord since you were saved. No, that doesn't mean that. But it does mean that you're not going to uh, commit to sin. There's times where we miss it. There's times where we let the flesh override the, and, and we miss. There's times. And God knows our hearts. He knows our motive. He knows if we really, truly want to serve him. He knows if we truly want to live for him. God knows. We're not fooling him. And you can't continue in sin and grace abound. It doesn't work that way, people. You can't expect grace to abound in your life if you're continuing in sin. And there are multitudes today that think that they can continue in sin and that grace is going to continue to abound. That It doesn't work that way. The scripture says that God gives grace to the humble. Amen? God gives grace to the humble, folks. What does it say about the proud? He says, I see the proud far off. God, it actually says that the Lord resists the proud. He resists the proud. Can you imagine knowing who Jesus is? Can you imagine him? Can you even imagine him resisting anybody? But he does. He resists the proud. Thank God. Thank God for the truth. Thank God that you're not deceived in this hour. And that you understand how grace works. That you're not one in this hour that's taking uh, in the grace of God and turning it into a license to sin. That you're not one that's taking God's grace and, and taking it for granted. Folks, the grace of God has appeared to all men doing what? Teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. This idea today that you can continue in sin, that you can continue in sin and grace will abound, and, and we see a lot of this today. We see a lot of folks today that believe this. They literally believe that they can continue in sin and grace will abound. 
I apologize. Someone was just trying to call in to the broadcast. Um, if you want to try calling in again, we'll go ahead and answer the phone. I apologize. We hung up by mistake there. But this idea today that, that you can continue in sin and, and somehow God is just going to keep pouring grace into your life. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't work that way. God's grace is absolutely marvelous. Amen? It's marvelous. God's grace is marvelous. But the Bible says God gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. The scripture says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Are you, are you understanding what, what that means? He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The scripture says he was a preacher of righteousness. You can't just continue in sin and in, 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 in the world and serve Jesus at the same time. That is a fallacy, people. That's a deception. But multitudes today believe they can do that. They think they can stay in the world and they can sin and they can be saved all at the same time. It doesn't work that way. That's not the gospel. That's not the truth. Jesus said these words, and we really need to let these words sink down into our ears. He said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself take up his own cross, right, and follow me. And he said this. He said, die daily. That's a life of denial. You deny yourself and you crucify the affections. You crucify your lust. You, you crucify that fallen nature that's lusting to disobey God. Is it any wonder that the followers of Jesus Christ were called disciples? I mean, you almost can't call yourself a Christian anymore today because people think that Catholics are Christians because they're calling themselves Christians. We probably should be calling ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. At least the Catholics don't call themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. Folks, you must understand that if you look at the scriptures in the New Testament, you will see they were first coined Christians at Antioch. They didn't call themselves Christians. That was mockery. The world was calling them Christians. They were persecuted. They were being persecuted. And so today when it's popular to be a Christian, you got to understand something's wrong with that. It should not be popular to be a Christian. And let me tell you, it's not popular to be a Christian, when you're a real Christian, when you're really Christ-like. I don't know how many of these folks are brothers and sisters in the Lord. I don't know how many of them that are being um, beheaded and what's going on right now. I don't know how many of those are true, blood-washed, born-again, saints of God, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I don't know. And it's not for me to judge that. But I do know this. A lot of what's being called Christianity today is not Christianity. Have you ever taken the time to look up what the word Catholic means? It means universal. There's nothing in a Catholic church, nothing that says anything about Christianity. And so where they come off calling themselves Christians, I don't know. Just because they say that Jesus is their Savior and they believe in the virgin birth, and all these things, does not make them a Christian. They've got to give up their pagan worship. They've got to give up their relics. They've got to give up their idolatry. You understand what I'm saying to you folks? The Catholic Church, according to the Scripture, is the whore of Babylon. And yet they're calling themselves Christians today. They're trying to mix themselves. 
You, you may not have known this, and you may get offended with me when I say this. Did you know the charismatic church came out of the Catholic church? It was called the charismatic renewal. It came out of Rome, folks. That's right. The Benny Hens, the Kenneth Culpins, uh, TBN, uh, all of that. It came out of the Catholic Church. You might not have known that, but it's the truth. You cannot be a true Christian in this hour, Christ-like, and continue in sin. Can't do it. You must turn from sin. Now, friend, I just want you to know, brothers and sisters, that is not a negative message. That's not a negative message. When you understand that the wages of sin is death, why would you want to sin? Knowing what sin does, why in the world would you want to continue in sin? Sin destroys. Sin brings death, people. But Jesus didn't come to save us in our sin. He came to save us from our sin. He came to deliver, amen, the captives. He came to set the captives free. Now, we don't have to continue in sin. Um, and the idea today that folks are continuing in sin, that grace might abound, is a deception. Did you know there's people in this world today that believe the more evil they are, the better? Because if they're really, really bad, real evil, then they can really receive God's goodness because they really need it. Friends, that's a deception. That is a deception. A lot, most folks today don't understand, truly understand what grace is. They don't really understand that grace is a gift. It's a gift. And that gift was given to us so that you and I can overcome sin, not live in it. So that we could be free from sin, not live in it. Sin will destroy your soul and take you to hell. Why in the world would Jesus give you grace to stay in sin? He doesn't. He gives you grace to be free. He gives you grace to be delivered. Paul the Apostle said, Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? He said, God forbid. How can we that are, that are living in sin, how can we that are in sin live unto Jesus Christ? You can't. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, you that are listening right now by way of broadcast, some of you have believed, have been believing that, that because you've been taught that. Your minister, whoever has taught you about the fact that they're trying to make you to believe that it's okay to continue in sin. But everything in the scripture tells you that you need to turn from it. And not only that, but Jesus has given you the ability to turn from sin. You know, one of the probably least, mess least preached messages in, in all of Christianity today is the message of the overcomer. You don't ever hear the message of the overcomer. Why is that? How come you don't hear ministers today preaching an overcoming message? How come you hear very few today calling themselves or calling the people of God saints? When's the last time you heard someone call one of God's people a saint? No, we call Peter saint, we call John saint, we call Paul saint. And the Catholic Church, you know, about worships them and calls them Saint Peter and Saint. 
Well, wait a minute. How come nobody's being called saint in this hour? My understanding is through the blood of Jesus Christ, he makes us saints. It's got nothing to do with our ability. It has everything to do with what he has provided for us. Jesus Christ has made us clean, has made us whole, has made us well, has made us uh, pure by his blood. So that we can live and not die. I mean, it's amazing to me how many people today believe that they've got this thinking that they can continue in sin and that God's grace is going to abound. Well, I want you to know that if you have that mentality or have that idea and you're living that way, Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life. He's not Lord. If it grieves you to sin against God, that's good. It should grieve you. And folks, you should you should so you should always sense the grieving of the Holy Ghost when it comes to sin. The Holy Ghost is always grieved with sin. And sometimes things that we would never think were sin are actually sin. Things that we would think we, we would be okay. And, you know, with God, it's not okay. It may be just a, a motive. It may be just, you know, God knows our motive, people. You may not think what you're doing is wrong, or you may not think what you're doing is, is uh, sin in the eyes of God, but God looks at the heart, and he sees your motive, why you're doing what you're doing, and he's grieved by that. Anything that is not of faith is sin. So if we're going to please the Lord and he's going to be Lord of our life, then we, have, then we need to obey him. We need to do what he says to do. Uh, just take the time to write down the scriptures. Do a Bible study on all the places where Jesus deals with sin. How about the one place where he says to the woman that they wanted to stone? What did Jesus say to her? He said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing comes upon you. How come you don't hear that message today? Jesus said, go and sin no more. Jesus said that. Jesus said, to whom you yield your members to, you're a slave to. If you yield your members unto unrighteousness, unto uh, lust and the flesh, that's what you're a slave to. He said to um, the Pharisees and the religious, he said, he said, you're all slaves. And they said, we're not slaves, we're children of Abraham. Jesus said, no, you're slaves to your sin. You're slaves to your flesh. You're slaves to your lusts. They thought he was talking about slavery as far as in the natural. He was talking about spiritually. You are slaves. Do you know most of God's people today are slaves? They're in bondage. In slavery. And sadly, it's not Jesus Christ that's Lord of their life. It's actually Satan that's Lord. A lot of times today in our world, we hear in the media and we hear, you know, we hear people calling, saying, saying that word Lord. They're not talking about Jesus, people. You may not know this, but people that follow Satan call Satan Lord. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Now, but you won't never find anybody calling Satan Jesus. I promise you that. And if you do, it's not going to bear witness with your spirit. Something's going to be off. Something won't be right. Yeah, any Anytime something goes into your spirit sideways, you know something's not right. That's God's mercy to let you know. Amen? If something's not fitting, 
if something does not go in smoothly and it seems like it's going in hard or it's going in sideways, that's not from God. The Holy Spirit doesn't force himself. Please listen to what I'm telling you. The Holy Ghost does not rape. Demons rape. The devil rapes. But if you ever hear a minister preaching or sharing the gospel and you feel like, feel dirty, or you feel like you're being raped, that's not the Holy Ghost, I assure you that. Holy Spirit is gentle. So submitting to the Lord requires the grace of God. You cannot even submit to Him without His grace. And then when you, you, when you do act upon His grace and submit and humble yourself, He gives you more. That's where the Scripture says He giveth more grace. Amen? Where sin abound, the grace of God does what? Much more abound. Where sin abounds, the grace of God does much more abound. Hallelujah. So, if Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, His grace is working in your life. And if His grace is working in your life, you're not continuing in sin. It's just that simple. And we need to thank God every single day for His grace. Because without His grace, we're no different than the world. Really. It's unmerited favor. But remember, God gives more grace. He gives more grace. But He's not going to give more grace to someone that's not already submitting to the grace he's already given. That's what Paul the Apostle was talking about when he said, I strive according to the power that worketh in me. I don't strive against it. I don't fight against it. I work with the grace of God. I yield to the grace of God. Do you understand how that works, folks? The grace of God you work with that grace of God, His presence, His strength, to work with God. And the scripture that goes along with that is, you work out what He works in. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. As He's working His grace into your life, you work out those things that displease the Lord, those things that grieve His Spirit. Now, Scripture says, uh, Know ye not, you are the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, how, how fearful is it if the Scripture says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How fearful is it when the temple, your body, is the temple of the Holy Ghost and you're continuing in sin? That's, that's a fearful thing. Because you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You are to glorify God in your body, which are His. That's His. You may not understand it, but you gave your life to Jesus when you were saved. You can't just take it back. You can be lost. You can spend eternity lost. You can spend eternity in hell. But you can't take your, 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 yourself back from Jesus. He's going to do with you as he wills, people. And that's why the scripture says, it says it's not him that willeth, and it's not him that runneth, but it's God that shows mercy. Amen? It's God that shows mercy. So... Praise God. I have to quit the broadcast here. We get someone outside the house mowing or something. So, 
God bless you and have a wonderful day in the Lord. Enjoy this wonderful Sunday. Amen. And rest in the Lord. God bless you.